All right, folks, welcome back. Uh, it was good to see everybody or most people earlier today. Hope everybody's doing well. Uh, so what we're going to talk about today, continuing uh, our discussion of the 1970s. Again, this one's going to be relatively short. We're getting into a little bit of history, uh, a little bit more of the 1970s today, particularly talking about the three presidents of the 1970s. Uh, first, we're going to start with Richard Nixon. Okay, Richard Nixon's a very interesting figure as president because I'll tell you, he was Richard Nixon was a great politician. He really was. He was a talented uh, political mind, um, a very good and, and shrewd politician. You know, part that maybe part of it uh, was his, was his problem as to what ultimately got him in trouble because he was such a good political mind. He served as vice president in the 1950s, which was a time of great growth under Eisenhower. Uh, and was a big time advisor in terms of a lot of the decision making during the uh, Eisenhower administration, especially when it came to communism, because Eisenhower was really more of a military guy and wasn't as interested in the political side of things. Okay, so Nixon uh, really kind of handled the ball with a lot of that stuff. And, you know, historically, we look at Richard Nixon as really kind of this failed president. Um, you know, that this guy that, uh, you know, was shady and weird and clumsy and awkward, uh, which is true. He, he was kind of all those things. Uh, but if you take away the whole Watergate thing, and I'll get into that later, uh, his presidency really probably would have been considered a great success. He did a lot of good things. OK, this is 1968 when Richard Nixon gets elected president. And then, of course, he. Uh, gets inaugurated in early 1969, uh, coming off 1968, which was probably like the worst year of the 20th century for the American people. 1968 was really, really a bad, bad year. Um, some of you might remember from, from AP last year, uh, or U.S. history even last year, how 1968 was just such a um, bad year for America with Martin Luther King getting assassinated, Robert Kennedy's assassination. Uh, lots of other attempted assassinations. Drug use was at a peak. Vietnam was going really bad. There was a big, um, there was a big free for all uh, riot at the Democratic National Convention in Chicago that year. So it was a really bad year. Anyway, so Nixon comes in in 1969 um, and almost immediately, uh, you know, gets to work in a variety of ways. Okay, one of the things that he does that's very successful, and I want you to understand, Richard Nixon was a very, very good foreign policy president. He was very strong in regards to foreign policy and his efforts in, in those areas are really important, okay? He strengthens our relations with the communist nations, um, kind of backing off this Cold War mentality a little bit, getting both sides to the table to come up with treaties and kind of cool those fears of there being, you know, a nuclear arm again and killing everybody because we we're definitely afraid of that in the 1950s and 60s the possibility of that happening with nuclear with nuclear bombs and stuff. Um, so we, we strengthen our relationship with the Soviet Union a little bit, so those problems get a little bit better. Uh, it's through a process called detente, D-E-T-E-N-T-E, detente, D-E-T-E-N-T-E. -E -E. uh, this process of just easing Cold War tensions, that's what detente is, the easing of Cold War tensions. Uh, so he strengthens relations with these communist countries, um, he becomes, he actually ultimately becomes the first president to visit communist China and officially opens diplomatic relations with China. We didn't even recognize China at all since it was founded in 1947 as a communist country. We're like, well, you know what, we're not going to recognize you. We'll deal instead with the island of Taiwan, where the old government of China escaped to when the communists took over China. So we said, well, we'll, we'll, still, we'll still recognize the non-communists, but China itself, we don't want anything to do with. Nixon goes over there and they kind of meet and talk through things and uh, open up diplomatic relations kind of for the first time since, uh, since the 1940s. So that's a big step. And you cannot understate, you know, the, the importance of that foreign policy accomplishment of uh, Nixon and being able to formally build re build a relationship with China. So he's doing better with communist countries and the Soviet Union and China. Uh, he also, 
starts to really bring a lot of troops home from Vietnam. People were clamoring. People were angry about the Vietnam War. It wasn't going well. People want to see American soldiers come home. Uh, and Nixon does that for us, right? He starts to bring folks home. Um, does some other things uh, in Vietnam during that time that are a little shady. Uh, I'm not going to get into all that. But for the most part, people were happier because troops were starting to come home in greater numbers. And we start to see the de-escalation of the Vietnam War. Okay, But ultimately, his presidency is, of course, going to be completely overshadowed by Watergate. So let's talk about Watergate for a minute. First of all, what is Watergate? Watergate is actually the name of a hotel in Washington, D.C. It's actually still there. In fact, um, on senior trip, um, who knows what's, uh, who knows what's going to happen with that, but senior trip, I usually, uh, I pointed out to you guys on the bus uh, when we go see the, the Kennedy Center and see the play at the Kennedy Center, the Watergate Hotel is kind of right next to that. So anyway, uh, so what happened? So the, the Democratic presidential nominee that year um, was a guy named George McGovern. Richard Nixon was a Republican. And some of people in the Nixon re-election campaign broke into the Watergate Hotel to get dirt on George McGovern. And, you know, they get away with it at first. Um, and Nixon wins the election, like, easily. He wins 49 of 50 states, so I don't even know why this had to happen. But in any event, um, Nixon wins, gets re-election, but then it, it breaks out that the people that broke into the Watergate in the McGovern, McGovern's campaign headquarters were actually, uh, you know, operatives for the Nixon campaign, the Nixon re-election campaign. Um, now, what gets Nixon in trouble? And the chances are he probably didn't know about this break-in and this attempt to find information. So in the crime itself, as we define crime, Nixon didn't really do anything wrong. The problem comes in the cover-up that followed. Nixon denied involvement. Nixon denied having any knowledge about it uh, and many, many other things. As it got worse, Nixon's behavior started to get more erratic and weird. Um, where ultimately uh, they hire a special prosecutor, a guy named Archibald Cox. Now he would be, Archibald Cox would be to the Watergate thing like Robert Mueller would have been to the whole Russia investigation, okay, with, with Trump. And ultimately Nixon fired Cox and, um, you know, Nixon fired Cox and, uh, that ultimately was a crime on the part of the president, something we heard about quite a bit in regards to the Trump impeachment, obstruction of justice, okay? Nixon is getting in the way of the justice system doing what it has to do by firing the special prosecutor, okay? Ultimately, Nixon was brought up on charges of, of, of perjury, uh, obstruction of justice, and something only the president can be accused of depriving Americans of their constitutional rights, because he's really the only person that can do that. So those are the actual charges that were brought up against Nixon. Um, tapes were released that showed that he had been lying to people because he knew about things that were going on. Nixon would have been impeached. He would have been removed from office and would have been the first president for that to ever happen to. So instead of all that happening, Nixon resigned the White House on September, or on, I'm sorry, on August 9th, 1974. He gives a speech, says, basically, I'm uh, uh, um, resigning the presidency that day at noon that day, I think, and uh, Gerald Ford becomes the new president. So that's Nixon. Gerald Ford, as president, again, he's a really interesting guy, okay? Gerald Ford's a really, really good guy. Let me tell you a little bit about Gerald Ford. One, that wasn't his birth name. He was born with the name Leslie King Jr. He's uh, actually adopted. He was the first president to actually have been an adopted kid. He was an All-American football player at the University of Michigan, uh, played center there uh, during the 1930s. Um, but as president, Gerald Ford really never had a chance. First of all, um, Nixon's vice president was a guy named Spiro Agnew, who had been the governor of Maryland. 
but he got in trouble in Maryland for some illegal activity. So he had to resign the vice presidency uh, because of that. So he had to resign also, and it wasn't even um, it wasn't even related to Watergate. So Ford comes in because he was the ranking Republican in the House of Representatives, and he was asked to become the new vice president. Okay. Um, Gerald Ford has the distinction of being the only president to not have been elected to either the presidency or vice presidency. Usually when you run for president, you run with a running mate, one is president, one is vice president. Gerald Ford, after Spiro Agnew stepped down, was made, was elevated to become Nixon's new vice president. So he's not elected vice president and he ultimately would never be elected president. He was appointed those things. So he's the only president ever that was never elected to either position. So essentially he's a guy we don't want. Um, but Gerald Ford, uh, you know, did the best he could with kind of the circumstances he had in front of him. People weren't gonna immediately say, okay, new president, we like this guy. We have faith in this guy, we're going to believe in him, okay? We're probably happy to see Nixon go, but people are so jaded and upset about the government that they're like, I don't even want to hear anything uh, from the president. This time. Okay. Uh, making matters worse, Gerald Ford decided that um, the first thing he needed to do was pardon Nixon of any crimes related to Watergate. Why did he do this? Because he wanted America to move on from the whole thing. And he figured a long trial involving the president would take up all the headlines and all this stuff and people would get upset about it. And Let's just let it go. Well, people really weren't too happy about that because it just showed like somebody was above the law. So that hurts Ford even more. He probably didn't really enjoy being president all that much, and he never really got the opportunity to accomplish much during his presidency. It was shrouded in the whole Nixon thing and, and Watergate and the resignation. Uh, people were upset with Republicans and were upset with with Nixon, and as a result of that, we're upset with Ford. He wasn't really going to have any chance to really build a really strong legacy for himself as president. Again, a really good guy, a very, very talented and skilled politician. He was just in a position uh, that was bad for anybody at that time. And no matter who was president uh, when Gerald Ford was, they probably would not have a chance to get reelected, and he didn't. Remember, Gerald Ford was a nice guy. He had two assassination attempts against him within the space of like a couple months. And they were both women. So two women tried to kill him. I'm gonna give you a link uh, on the email there. You can look at the videos of uh, about the two women that tried to assassinate Gerald Ford. It's the 70s, man, weird times. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the presidency of Jimmy Carter. So Jimmy Carter's presidency was uh, a difficult one. Okay, he had to deal with a lot of circumstances and a lot of problems in the United States during this time. All the stuff that we talked about in the last set of slides, all the problems in the 1970s, the economy, the um, governmental issues, the environmental problems, uh, foreign problems are all coming to a head during the presidency of Carter. But we wanted to change. We don't want a Republican at this time because people still feel kind of um, taken advantage of by Nixon, and he was a, a Republican, so because of that, people don't like them. So we go with a guy named Jimmy Carter. Now, Jimmy Carter met well, but his presidency, mm, you know, really had some struggles, and he was forced to deal with a lot of things. Now, on the good side, on the good side, Jimmy Carter brokered a peace in the Middle East between Egypt and Israel, which had been at war for a long time. Uh, so he managed to broker a peace between those two countries, uh, which is really, really good. And he got the Nobel Peace Prize for it. But other than that, his presidency was really beset with a lot of problems. So one of the big problems that occurs during the presidency of, of Jimmy Carter is something called stagflation. Okay. Now, during the presidency of Carter, we see the inflation rate continually go up. and unemployment go up. Ultimately, during the economic downturn in the late 70s and early 80s, I think unemployment got as high as like 13%, which is the highest it had ever been um, since the Great Depression, right? Uh, so that's pretty bad. Um, 
We'll see how it gets with this whole coronavirus thing, but hopefully not that bad. But who knows? We'll see what happens. Anyway, uh, so what stagflation is, and you have it there in your in your notes. What stagflation is is when the inflation rate is high, um, but the but there's very little economic growth. Okay. Now usually when there's economic growth, inflation rate kind of naturally grows. The inflation rate kind of naturally increases during this time. Let me give you an example, right? So say you go to McDonald's, you want to get something off the dollar menu. In the normal inflation rate, you have a dollar to pay for that, okay? Um, and say they change the dollar menu to a $3 menu. So you would, with the inflation, making the $1 menu now a $3 menu, you would assume that in a period of, of normal economic growth and inflation, that you'd have the $3 to be able to get something, right? Well, when you have stagflation, that means that $1 menu becomes a $3 menu, but you still only have $1 to get something, okay? Unemployment's high, people are making more money and inflation is going up, meaning things are costing more money, but people aren't making more money to be able to pay for them. This is a really, really difficult financial and economic situation, and it's hard to reverse and get out of it. Carter has to deal with that through his presidency. Uh, and then finally, um, you know, we kind of get out of it in the 1980s. Another big problem that Carter has to deal with is the Iran hostage crisis. In November 1979, um, Iran, uh, the American embassy in Iran was taken over by some angry Iranians because they didn't like American uh, policies towards Iran and the treatment of the Iranian uh, leader at that time who was very pro-American. So they got rid of the leader. He was over in America getting treated for cancer. Uh, and then they took over the, uh, the, the uh, <clears throat> they took over the U.S. Embassy there and took 52 Americans hostage. Jimmy Carter worked tirelessly for 444 days from November 4th, 1979 until their release um, on January 20th, 1981. Carter worked really, really hard to secure the release of these um, people, but he was unable to do it. And it, it basically became the big, uh, one of the big failures of his, his presidency as a whole. And what's important about the date that they finally get, do get released, January 20th, 1981, what happened that day? January 20, 1981 was Inauguration Day. And who was inaugurated that day? Not only the greatest American that's ever lived, Ronald Wilson Reagan, thank you very much. And they were released. Finally, Jimmy Carter, uh, the last little piece here, and that will be done for today, uh, was the 1980 Summer Olympic boycott that took place uh, because the Soviet Union had invaded Afghanistan. Uh, we didn't support the invasion of Afghanistan. The Olympics in 1980, the Summer Olympics in 1980, were supposed to be in Moscow in the Soviet Union. And we said, if you don't get out of Afghanistan, we're not coming to the Olympics. Carter thought that was a good way to get the Soviet Union to back down, but they didn't. Instead, he took away the opportunity to compete for many, many athletes that for many of them, you know, in the Olympics would be their only opportunity to get there. And they worked their whole life to get to these Olympics. The Olympics meant a lot to us at this time as well, because it was an opportunity to show our superiority over the Soviet Union during the Cold War. Remember what happened earlier that same year at the Winter Olympics. What happened earlier that same year at the Winter Olympics was the miracle on ice when we beat the Soviet Union team that was supposed to be unbeatable uh, and why was that such a big deal for America? Because it was democracy beating communism. Now, because of Carter's decision to pull us out of the Olympics, he's effectively taken away our opportunity to do this and has dashed the dreams of many, many athletes. It's pretty much sunk. Any possibility that Carter would have to get reelected in 1980, and thank God, because we got Ronald Reagan for it. So. God bless that man. Anyway, folks, that's it. I will send you another thing on music tomorrow, and that will be all of our videos for this week. Hope everybody's well. See ya.